Welcome to an overview of the role of the School Library Media Specialist. The following presentation was pre-recorded to help new media specialists get a jump on the FY21 school year. Hello everyone. As you heard in the opening, this session was pre-recorded in the hopes of helping brand new media specialists get ready for the FY21 school year. We're hoping that the information in this uh, program helps you think about your role as a library media specialist going forward, gives you lots of resources, and connects you to the Department of Library Media Services and the two specialists that are there for your support. So welcome. We had sincerely hoped that this would be a face-to-face -face session, but unfortunately due to time constraints and other requirements, uh, we have made it a recorded session. So we had planned to share these questions and get feedback from the participants and listen to your memories and your answers to these questions. But unfortunately, we had to go with a recording. So what I'm gonna do today is answer the question myself, share my answer with you, and ask you to reflect on what your answer would be and how that would shape what you think about would be important in your library programming or something you would like to do in your library programming. So the first question is, what is your first or most vivid memory of a school library? Now in my case, it's elementary school, a long time ago. So I remember a very small room filled with books and of course no technology. But I was allowed to wander the shelves and choose a book of my liking and I enjoyed that very much. As a matter of fact, I even remember one of the titles that was my favorite it was a series about a little black Scotty dog called um, Angus. So it was a very pleasant memory for me, something I looked forward to. So as you think about your memory about school libraries, I hope it's for one, I hope it's a pleasant one. It may or may not be. But think about it in terms of the memories you might be creating for the students that you'll serve. Perhaps it's about creating a safe space for them. Perhaps it's about helping them at the last minute rush, get a paper ready and get it turned in on time. There's a lot of different memories you could leave students with, especially when you're working with the entire school and all the students. So reflect on that and think about how that'll make you uh, a better media specialist. So we wanted to begin with introductions and I do have two people to introduce to you, myself and my colleague. Uh, and we had hoped to get person on person introductions with you as new media specialists. But I promise you we will make a connection sometime soon. Uh, at least through email, and if not, through another webinar, because we are in the uh, social distancing situation that we are in. But we hope to meet you face-to-face, -face, either virtually or in real life, very soon. So my name is Holly Ann Ruffner. I've been with the Department of Library Media Services for 11 years, and prior to that, I was a school library media specialist at two different elementary schools for a period of total of 14 years. My first elementary school uh, was Westward Elementary, and I was part of the team that helped lead the, um, the application for their pro primary years program uh, as a part of the IB organization. Then I moved on to Discovery Key Elementary, helped open that as a brand new facility opening a brand new school is a very interesting experience. And um, that was a science-focused school. So I've had a lot of experience in running programs that needed to be tailored to very specific focus or theme of the school. Now my colleague, Lisa Seymour, that you see here in her avatar, is unable to be part of this recording today, but I promise you, you will meet her very soon and I'm going to do my very best job to connect you to all of the different ideas and pieces of information that she has in this presentation. And uh, she looks forward to hearing, you, hearing from you by email and um, seeing you virtually as well very soon. So here we go. In the past, we've had a very 
material centric, if you will, view of the library. I've been fighting this library model almost my entire career, trying to transition to a more user centric model where the focus is on the, the customer, the people, the students and the faculty and what they need, where the um, services are uh, sometimes self-service like self-checkout and where there's a lot of interaction and hands-on uh, activities and materials to engage in. There's a lot of technology and library resources are available 24 seven instead of like when I was a child, they were only available when the library was open. It was your turn to go to the library and there were only books that you had to borrow and return physically. Now we have digital resources and lots of technology, and it's very important in the library. We're truly one of the technology integrationists in the school. It's a very important role. So another question, what was your first encounter with technology? Now for me, again, a long time ago, my very first school westward, when I got there, I found on the table two Apple IIe's. I had never used an Apple IIe computer, had to figure out how to do that all on my own and use them and keep them up and running and teach the kids how to use them. So that was my very first experience with technology. Maybe yours is either older than that or newer, but think about what it took to get you started with technology and how you felt as a, as a newbie with technology. Sometimes that's our role with our students, is helping them learn a new technology, even though we think of them as the digital generation and so on. But sometimes we're teaching them a tool and helping build their confidence. We're also one of the few places in the school where perhaps the student gets to use technology to express their learning, to express their ideas, to express their emotions through poetry or song with digital storytelling, some sort of electronic program to help them build music. The library can be this place. And so very often we're that spot where the student experiences technology from a different angle, not just from the angle of uh, doing an assessment or a preset reading program, but something creative. And that's one of the best things about being a media specialist is helping students do creative things. So classroom, classroom versus a library media center. It's a little bit different. It's not just the biggest classroom in the school. It's a program and it's a service. This is one of my favorite quotes from the book Hacking School Libraries, which I highly recommend to you. It's an easy, fun read and it's easily available um, on your best app, uh, favorite app, online platform, Amazon, whatever that might be. But library programming and library service, it is a customer service field. It's about meeting people's needs when they are asking, not necessarily always just following a set schedule and having uh, them wait to listen to us. So in a library, customer service looks like this. You need to be very knowledgeable about your collection, your print collection and your electronic collection, and maybe other resources on the World Wide Web, or at least how to search and look for appropriate re resources on the internet. You need to be a person that's um, a, a solution-oriented person. People come to you with information problems and it may take a minute or two or a little effort to solve that problem for them, but that is our job, that is our service that we provide to, to students, which is slightly different than the instructional role, which we also perform. We are a teacher, but we do offer this kind of customer service for our faculty, our students, and our parents. It's important because we are leaving a lifelong impression on a student that will grow up to be a taxpayer and vote whether to keep libraries going or not. It's important because if they can't get help from us, they will seek help somewhere else and may or may not end up with quality 
vetted and safe information. So they're not an interruption to our work. They're the reason for our work. Another question, what is your favorite place to read? Now my favorite place to read is outdoors. I think this is because when I was a very small child, my mother used to take my brother and I out under a skinny little orange tree for shade, spread a blanket and read us a book on summer afternoons. I think it was mostly so that we would hopefully fall asleep and give her a break, but she always shared a book. And I've continued to enjoy to read outdoors, someplace with a breeze and some sunshine. Um, you may have a different favorite place to read. Think about the possibilities you have to create favorite places to read for your students or to offer, say older students, a quiet place to engage in ideas and read, maybe to escape from the noisy and crowded and intimidating cafeteria during lunchtime. There are a lot of reasons to create quiet places to read for students. Another one of those memories we're creating for them. It's all part of the programming. So promoting the love of reading is a, a huge piece of that. It's a huge piece of library programming. I'm sure that you've come to this work because you love reading and books. Perhaps you're a reading teacher or a, a reading coach, so you already have lots of ideas. This slide has a, a basic list of some of the uh, standard things that are done in libraries, such as book fairs and so on. But it also lists some very specific programs SSYRA and FTR are our state reading lists. SSYRA, if you haven't heard of it, is the Sunshine State Young Readers Award, and FTR stands for Florida Teen Reads. Both of these programs and lists are created by our media specialist statewide, our state organization FAME, that's Florida Association for Media and Education. Committees for that professional group create these lists, and it they put an enormous amount of hours into reading in order to create the lists. And then we use those lists for our own promotion that uh, Library Media sponsors, which is Battle of the Books. I'm going to talk to you about that in a second. But these lists um, are for pleasure reading, help promote pleasure reading among students, very contemporary uh, fiction. Another service we've been able to engage in is the um, BAM, Music and uh, Books and Music Festival formerly known as April is for Authors, that organization helps us bring authors to, to physically visit schools. Now, whether we'll be able to do that or not this year, in the age of uh, social distancing and distance learning, who knows? But it, in the past, it's been very successful. Uh, also, there's two programs mentioned here, Project Lit and ReadWoke. These links will be available to you. I'll be happy to send you the PDF copy of this slide deck, and those will be hot links. And you can click and learn more about Project Lit and Read Woke, or you can Google it and, and find out about it. But there are ways to use those lists for book clubs and school-wide reads, um, very interesting programs that you should look into. So Battle of the Books is our signature program from Library Media Services. My colleague, Lisa Seymour, is the lead person on our Battle of the Books program. And she will be speaking about this again when we convene our uh, Welcome Back session, which is called the Media Specialist Guide to FY21. And that program will be done once in July and once in August. Watch your inbox for invites. Uh, to those sessions, and there'll also be a recording available. So she will talk more about the schedule for Battle of the Books, but there, the link in the first bullet will give you the um, basic timeline and information about how to participate if you're really interested. Something to think about for next year to add to your reading promotion ideas. A very important part of library philosophy is being inclusive. And serving the whole school does mean that you're representing everyone, not just in letting them in the doors, but in the books that you buy, the content of the books you buy, the, read, the books you read aloud, and the books you display. It means thinking about the needs of 
a variety of different individual groups, ESE and ELL and many others. It means working to create a self and safe and inclusive environment for all students, a safe place for them to come. It's a very important part of library programming. I hope you'll think a lot about that as you develop your ideas for FY21. You may have heard of Makerspace. Makerspace is a big part of a library program. It's been growing for the past, oh, maybe five, eight years. This slide is a little crowded, but it does have um, book suggestions to get an idea about Makerspace if you're unfamiliar with the movement and the activities. Uh, there are three people there to follow on Twitter or to look up on Google. They all have websites that are very helpful. Laura Fleming is the author of the second book on the list, Worlds of Making, and is, was a very early pioneer in makerspaces in libraries. So it's something to look into. Even if we're in a virtual situation, we've had a, several media specialists be very successful having makerspace activities pushed out through their virtual library. So it is possible to still encourage creativity and critical thinking and design thinking even through uh, a web presence. But it's a really fun part of a physical library where there's a space for them to sit down and tinker and experiment and, and engage in challenges in uh, designing and creating things or programming things. So if you haven't looked into Makerspace, uh, look into that ahead of planning your program. So instruction is always an important question and it is a very important part of what we do. It is a portion of what we do. So the first thing most new people want to know is where are your standards? And quite frankly, they're a little bit all over the place. Um, we tap into standards from a variety of programs. The Florida Department of Education posts two sets of standards and guidelines for media specialist use right on the Florida DOE site. These are both links to the reads document and the um, information literacy model known as fines. Those are two good starting places to, to discover what kind of standards guide the programming you might choose and the instruction you might do in a media center. You can also tap into CPOMS and look under courses and you will find courses in library media for K through five, six and six, eight. We generally keep the ISTE standards in mind when we're planning our instruction because the, that's where we get that technology integrations piece. And the standards that really outline the spirit, the mission, the beliefs, the underpinnings of a library program and library instruction come to us from the American Association for School Librarians, National Standards for School Libraries. They were brand new in 2017 this is the third or fourth set of standards and guidelines I have been under as a library media specialist, and I think they are by far the best ones, best ones yet. When you get this slide deck as a PDF, all of these items are hot links, and you can explore each one in turn. I just want to give you a closer look, though, at the ASL national standards to give you an idea of how they're set up. The icons across the top of this slide represent the sh what we call shared foundations of, of library work and library instruction. Inquire, include, collaborate, curate, explore, and engage are the areas of work that we deal with when we're dealing with students. Each of the uh, pieces of text under those icons describe that shared foundation. But if you take a look at the words in orange, you'll see they represent the kinds of things, either skills or mindsets or activities that we want our students to be able to exhibit. It'll give you an idea in a broad sense of what instruction in a media center should look like. Now, you can engage in these standards more deeply at standards.asl.org, or you can click this link here, which we will do, and let it load. This is the ASL standards framework for learners. There are three frameworks, one for learners, one for library programs, and one for librarians. They all 
work around the shared foundations of inquire, include, collaborate, curate, explore, and engage. And they um, bounce off of the domains of think, create, share, and grow. And they intersect and describe the activities in each of those categories. Now, you can download this once you get the slide deck. Just click it and, um, and you'll see there's a download button and you can um, look into this further. You can also look at the standards um, online. There is a, um, a full version of the standards, a very informative book that you can borrow from the professional library once we get back open. Um, so you can call and ask for that if you're interested. So this bulleted list represents the, the areas of instruction we need to think about. And some of them are very closely related. Information literacy is about understanding how to choose quality literacy, liter, um, information, how to check sources. Media literacy is uh, news literacy and sources again. And it all wraps around the research process. It's one of the steps in the research process, collecting and vetting information before you use it in your project. It's also related to digital citizenship where students learn to use information that they find on the web in uh, a legal and uh, ethical fashion. Everything from citing your uh, sources to not using uh, copyrighted material to create a project and then claiming that material as your own. There's a, a lot to discuss in digital citizenship. And then there, of course, is our favorite literature appreciation. We talk about literature from all different angles, depending on the grade, encourage uh, pleasure reading, and, um, and increase a student's uh, love of reading. So those are all our areas of um, instruction. And you'll notice on the sticky note, where possible, Best practice dictates that they're taught in collaboration with the classroom. And we can talk more about this um, in the fall, and I can connect you to people that have wonderful ideas about how to connect the classroom curriculum and the library curriculum. It is possible to do that. Your other role as a media specialist is to build a collection of resources, curating resources. And the one we, ones we think of first, of course, are, are print books. Uh, but there's a lot of curation to a collection. So no matter what you're curating, you need a plan first. And this very busy slide groups together all the things we think about as we build and maintain a collection. It's a quick introduction to what you need to be thinking about. We actually have in Palm Beach County a school board policy that governs governs the selection of library materials. It's STBBC 8.12. That is a direct link to that policy. And within it, you'll see 17 criteria that are used to gauge the quality of a piece of material before we put it in our collection. And I know that seems tedious, and you will learn how to do it very quickly, and you will have tools to help you do this. Uh, reviews are one of the key tools that help us meet the selection criteria and help us make sure that we're, that we're procuring very quality materials for our collection. The review sources listed here are just a few of many, but um, the first two are linked for you. The School Library Journal is, a, is an excellent resource, not only for reviews, but articles about what is new and trending in libraries, ideas for library programming, um, and many other things. It's a very worthwhile publication. Um, it is online to a certain extent, but portions, portions of it are available to paid subscribers only. So you might want to consider subscribing to School Library Journal. Um, wait until you get back to your school and see what your school budget and what your previous media specialist purchased. Uh, you may inherit a school subscription to School Library Journal. Booklist is a publication of ALA. Uh, the American Library Association, and it is 100% reviews. It does review material from uh, what we call birth to death, all ages, not just school material, but it's a very interesting uh, source 
of reviews for school material. And then the third one is School Library Connection, which you actually already have access to through your portal tile. Um, we have a subscription for media specialists. This tool as well includes many more resources other than reviews. It has um, articles, it has lesson plans, all kinds of ideas for library programming and positions on library programming and library work. And you need to search your em employee portal for School Library Connection. If the tile doesn't come up, give me an email and I will check in to see why it doesn't come up on your, on your screen. There's some recommended tools for analyzing and knowing your collection or finding reviews. And you'll see the, the asterisk there. We will help you get accounts for these two tools, Mackin.com and Follett Tidal Wave. And this will help you also uh, in a source for reviews. And the Tidal Wave also has an analysis tool for your current collection. And we can help you learn, learn how to use that tool to know uh, very minute details about your collection and help you decide where you need to focus your purchasing. It's very useful. So um, if you don't hear from us directly before uh, August, about your accounts for Mackin and Follett, do send us an email and we'll, we'll work on that together and get you access. When selecting materials, it is very important, always has been, not just because of the current climate and the current happenings, in our, in our world right now, but we have been working hard to foster diversity in our book collections for many years. And this link leads you to the site, We Need Diverse Books, which is an extremely helpful tool in examining what kind of materials uh, represent different marginalized groups, because a library is for everyone, like we said earlier in the presentation. And this will help you locate books that you may not be familiar with depending on your orientation on the group you belong to, to make sure that you are presenting books that represent all the students in your school. And we'll be talking a lot about this with all the media specialists uh, this coming fall. It's gonna be a big theme for us talking about diversity in our collections. Uh, the box in the middle is a reminder that we do have bid vendors for library materials. And these are the vendors you need to use when you're purchasing books for a library collection and uh, digital resources for that matter. It is bid controlled. So that bid was updated recently and we will be talking about it more uh, during our media specialist guide to FY21 training. And there's a resource where you can find those um, vendor lists and I'll be telling you about that resource in a minute. But you do want to pay attention uh, to our to our bid vendors because that is that is the purchasing uh, rule. So after you buy and you collect, books are not good forever, not just because of their condition, but their information ages and becomes out of date or passe. And so we do a process called weeding. Weeding is a is a uh, thoughtful process of deselecting books that are no longer useful to our patrons or no longer reliable information for our patrons. And we do that based on some uh, guidelines that are used nationally called the crew guidelines. And there's a very long full version and an abridged version. They're both linked from this slide and you can dig into them if you like, or we may have a session for new media specialists uh, on weeding and, um, and selection for that matter later in, in the fall. But if you wanna get a head start, they're great things to read. And then the third link is a blog post from one of the thought leaders in our field. Her name is Jennifer Lagarde. She uh, blogs at uh, The Adventures of Library Girl. She's very entertaining and um, very informative. And this link is to her blog post about weeding, why it's important, and how to keep your library collection fresh. It's one of the best articles I've ever read on, on weeding. It's a, it's a quick and fun read, and I highly recommend it to you. Um, this last box, before we leave this slide, it's very uh, important for you to know that a collection development plan, a written plan for what you're going to collect and how you're going to collect it, is required by school board policy. It is 
uh, policy that we have a collection development plan individually written for each school, and that that plan is available in print on demand to the public. Uh, so that is um, another one of your tasks. You will find that there is a collection development policy that your pre that your predecessor probably wrote, and you can work on that to update it for the for the next year. And there'll be more about that in some trainings. But just a heads up, it is required. Now, this link, a plan is required, is not to policy, but it's again to a great one pager from Jennifer Lagarde that explains why a collection plan is very important. And um, it's a great introduction to uh, a collection development plan. Again, I recommend it to you when you get these slides as a PDF, um, all the links will be uh, clickable. Virtual librarianship. So you're going to need a website, and that might not surprise you considering our distance learning situation that we went into recently. But it's important whether we are face to face and have a physical library or we only have distance learning. No matter the model next year, virtual librarianship is key no matter what. And we have a lot of resources to help you with that. So um, a fun saying is the show must go online. You need a virtual presence to market your library, to bring the world into your library. We have media specialists that have been very successful bringing in author visits into their physical library through Skype and Google Meets and using the big interactive uh, flat panels that are available in the, in the physical media center and their, ch their children, their students engaging in discussions with very well-known authors. So that's only one example of a way to bring the world into your library. You could bring other experts for students to interview and discuss and listen to. So um, online presence is very important for communicating, for sharing resources, for supporting teachers and students. And your virtual presence can be built using the Google apps that are, that are free, of course, to all our, our teachers and, and students for that matter. So, um, we have several ways for you to uh, sharpen your skills in the technology tools that will help you build a, um, a web presence. Our friends in EdTech have a tremendous training site. There are recorded webinars on the G Suite products there. And they also have some trainings in ELM that have to do with the Google Apps. And then our very own Lisa Seymour is leading a virtual librarianship training. It is It will be available in ELM for sign up by the time you view this recording. And it will also be delivered live on the dates you see on the screen, July 7th, July 22nd, and August 5th. So you have plenty of chances to engage with Lisa and learn uh, everything she has to share about virtual librarianship. She's very skillful and is there to support you, help, help you build and improve and maintain your virtual library presence. So I look forward to you engaging in that training with Lisa. She has a lot to share. Now, this portion of the uh, presentation, I was going to do optional. I was going to ask the, the participants if they needed to hear about certification or what's on the uh, Florida Certification Teacher Exam for K-12 Educational Media. But we'll just run through it regardless. You may already be certified. I have no way of knowing because I'm pre-recording the session. But this slide has links to materials that will help you with that exam should you need them. So when you get the PDF, you can check these out. We have um, books that are available through the professional library once we get back in our physical buildings. Those will be available. And the second two links come from the Florida DOE and give you an idea of the types of competencies that are tested um, on the um, FTCE for educational media. And you can also always reach out to Lisa and I with, with your questions. So if you are already certified, hooray you. And if you aren't, uh, we are happy to support you and um, make sure you have a successful uh, experience with the exam. So we've gone through a lot of information, it's sort of a data dump, if you will. Um, and so you may be saying, where do I start? This is too much stuff. Well, the best place to start is with your library and your patrons. 
And here's some suggestions of where, where you can do that. You can do some of it virtually now in the summer, even when you can't get into your uh, respective buildings. There are some things you can look at. You can look at the demographics of your school on the public school showcase. That's uh, linked right here in the presentation, the first bullet. Uh, however, it's also easy to find under schools, uh, other resources, and it says public school showcase. And you can read the, the demographics of your school and get, get an idea. Now, maybe you've been at your school and have just transitioned from a classroom teacher there to the media center. So, so you are aware and you know your, your students and your group and their needs and your school improvement plan. But if you've come from another school to your current posting as a media specialist, you want to look at those demographics. You also want to make yourself familiar with the district, district strategic plan. Um, our work is very much related to several areas of that strategic plan. Uh, raising third grade reading scores, creating a safe and inclusive environment. A lot of library work is uh, very closely associated with that strategic plan. Uh, and knowing that plan will help you build a program that supports the district goals and objectives. I've already mentioned that you can learn your collection by looking at uh, Destiny Library Manager and in Tidal Wave, and we will help you know how to do that. That second piece, Tidal Wave, you do have to have a specific account to see the uh, Tidal Wave analysis. So we, we will work on that together to get that connection for you. And you can dig into that and learn your collection even before you walk into your, your space, which hopefully we get to do in the fall. But if, if we don't, you can still know it electronically. Um, Destiny admin training is another important piece to put on your checklist for the summer. Uh, there's information at the end of this presentation about your first step, and then we will uh, continue that in a more face-to-face -face way um, later in the summer. So um, be sure you look into that uh, at the end of the presentation and you uh, engage in that, um, that tutorial and answer that form. The last thing on the list, please don't panic that it says non-classroom teacher evaluation protocols. You are an instructor. You are uh, considered a teacher. They give that very difficult name of non-classroom. It means you support the entire school. And there is a separate evaluation tool that uh, is created by our professional development department and professional growth. And they do uh, encourage its use. Uh, you principal does have a choice between the classroom model and the non-classroom model, but you should take a look at the one that's intended for a media specialist and see if you can engage in that one with your, with your principal because it does go beyond uh, evaluating you on your teaching only and it gives you credit for the extra work you do supporting the entire school. Uh, by the way, guidance counselors are also evaluated against that same tool. So that link will take you there so that you can explore it more. Words of wisdom that I received when I was actually in library school and uh, working towards becoming a media specialist, that you need to work on support, uh, whatever problem it is that keeps your principal up at night. Know your school's needs and, and what they're working on and be part of the solution if at all possible, through the library program. That's really, really important to be right there in the center of all the goals of your school. So this slide helps you with getting to know your collection. It's again, um, reminding you to search the collection in Destiny Library Manager and Tidal Wave. But when you get access to your physical space, take a walk around, look for the standard sections of uh, a library, fiction, nonfiction, and if you're in elementary school, easy, which is picture books. Look for sub collections. Look at the signage. Does the signage help your users find the correct areas, the areas they're looking for? Can they tell where to go for fiction or nonfiction? Also, if particularly if you are in secondary, your your collection may be um, genreified. It may be divided up by genre. Um, see if that is the case and see if the signage is good enough to get the students to the genre that they're looking for. There's lots of ways to get to know your collection. You need to uh, be able to, to tap into that knowledge and know 
um, what books you can uh, pick up quickly and offer to your students. So to begin your Destiny Access training, because yes, you can see Destiny, every teacher can click the tile for Destiny and see the catalog. And so you can start there. But to start your journey towards uh, a full Destiny Admin Access, you need to view the pr presentation that's linked right here. It's the presentation on the features of the CERC Desk login, which allows you to circulate materials to your faculty and will be useful to you immediately upon getting into school. Uh, and at the end of that presentation will be information on how you're going to book appointments so we can have a face-to-face -face rather than just a recorded training about the rest of the features in the Destiny system that are available only to the library administrator, which will be you um, as the media specialist. So be sure when you get this um, PDF that you um, click on that link and um, engage in that training. We talked about getting to know your print collection. You have a digital collection too. Um, we have materials that are uh, purchased centrally from out of our office and our budget to support every student across the district with digital reference materials and ebooks. And these are the basic ones that you'll need to get to know. You can use um, the link in the middle of the page, our digital resource uh, overview page. It'll explain some of this. Or you could just click right into them out of your portal, and explore them on your own. You can't break them. Uh, click and get to know how they work. Search and see what you find. Um, there's the categories for you, elementary and secondary. And yes, Gale Research is um, in all of them, including it's under the ebook category because we have nonfiction ebooks in the Gale Research portal. They are customized by grade level. So elementary students, when they click the Gale Research tile, they get a totally different collection of databases and uh, eBooks, totally different from the middle school student and the high school student. You can see uh, one tool is specifically high school only, even though everyone sees it on their uh, employee portal, uh, the SERS Researcher, that is a ProCon database that is um, very mature in content and is specifically for the high school student. Our ebook platforms are there for you to explore. Again, these illustrations are exactly the way the tile looks in your portal. If you will research uh, or search rather in your portal for the tile title, just like you see it on this slide, for example, world book with no space in between the word world and book, the tile will come up for you. Um, the word Mac and Via is written without spaces as well. So if you just follow the example on the screen, you will find a tile that looks exactly like these and you can click right into the um, to the resource. These resources are, are single sign-on or they authenticate through the portal. If you go to worldbook.com and try to log in, you're not going to have success. Log into your portal, look for the tile and click it, and these resources will authenticate from home or inside the district network and you can search them fully. So if you have any trouble finding these styles in your portal or using the resources, do reach out to Lisa and I and we will help you. We'll find out why it's not in your portal, but it should be. I, I doubt you'll uh, be at a loss to find them. So what Lisa and I both want you to know very strongly is that we do have your back. Library and Media Services is an entire department devoted to the total support of library media specialists, media clerks, the Destiny Library System, 15 digital resources, and also cataloging books for you when necessary. We have a whole team of paraprofessionals that work to support you in ordering and cataloging. You have Lisa and I to support you with ideas about programming and instruction, and we have these resources that you see linked here. Library Current is our main website with our current information, with tabs about everything. And that link will take you there so that you can explore. The LMS resource site is an invitation only Google site that has resources for media specialists. It has the help, uh, quick helps for Destiny and um, uh, our vendor list 
and lots of other resources and that is linked there for you. And if it does ask for access, you simply click it and the email will come to me and we'll open up the access to you. We also hope you will join our Google Plus community, also known as Library, Library Current. This is a spot where you can uh, see other media specialists ideas, share ideas, um, see what uh, other people are doing, post your successes, and connect and network with your fellow media specialists. Uh, we are on Twitter. At Library Current is our Twitter account for library media services. And Lisa and I both tweet individually on library topics. Uh, Lisa Seymour One and HMRUFF. So look us up on Twitter and give us a follow. So let's pull it all together before we stop. Here's a final list of things that will help you shape your librarianship and get you started in the field. We do have a, uh, a longer asynchronous uh, course to introduce you to all aspects of librarianship, offer you a chance to reflect on those items, plan things for your programming, for your collection, and so on. That registration will be available in ELM by August 4th. It is run through a Google Classroom. It's completely on demand and self-paced and will be open for most of the school year. So you can do it um, as slowly or as quickly as you like. And you can earn about 20 points for engaging in that course. It is called Essential Skills for New Media Specialists. Um, there's technology trainings available of all kinds. The Destiny Library uh, Manager training I've already mentioned. Lisa's course, Virtual Librarianship. If you're not a Google Certified Educator, I encourage you to look into that. You can either do it through ELM and uh, EdTech's sponsorship of that and uh, get points while you earn the certification from Google, or you can just go straight to Google uh, and work through the certification uh, on your own there. But um, being skilled in all the Google apps is especially important in our district. We also have another free tool, well, free to us, uh, we have a subscription to Adobe Spark, and that is a great tool for uh, marketing your media center, making items for your virtual uh, library site. It's also a great tool to teach students to use to explore, express their learning, um, and um, they find it very enjoyable. They act, there's a tile in your portal. <laughs> uh, it's sort of a theme. Uh, so. If you haven't uh, engaged in Adobe Spark, you can circle back to the EdTech training site. They have some uh, recorded trainings posted on Adobe Spark, I believe. We have some links to Adobe training posted off our library current site. So if you'd like to engage in that, um, you don't have to wander around on your own. There are some uh, trainings to give you a jump start. Plus, Lisa is always happy to talk about Adobe Spark. It's one of her favorite tools. There's uh, a link to the book I mentioned earlier, The Hacking School Libraries. I believe I put a link that uh, takes you out to Amazon, but it's easy to find in other locations. And a link to School Library Journal, which is worth the engagement, even if you um, engage in the on just the free online uh, resource. And it's a little hard to feather that out right now because during the pandemic, it has been totally free. But at some point, there will be that return to uh, parts of it will be for subscribers only. And of course, if you enjoy print more than you like digital, you'll want to subscribe so you get the print copy of the journal in, in case that's the format you prefer. Uh, Future Ready Librarians, if you haven't heard of them, is a Facebook group and you might want to look into that. Another place to engage and network with people that do the same work as you because sometimes, honestly, it is isolating because you're the only one at your school that has your challenges and your needs and your uh, requirements. And so sometimes it can be a little bit lonely. So engaging in, in uh, groups like Future Ready Librarians and connecting to the rest of the Palm Beach County media specialists through Google Plus uh, and through our professional organizations really helps um, cut down on some of that feeling of being isolated. So one more reminder, this is your next step. You need to view the tutorial at this bit.ly, so if you don't want to wait for the PDF copy of this presentation, you can copy down that bit.ly right now 
and it will lead you directly to a short tutorial on the CERC desk login and, um, and a form to help you set up dates for further Destiny admin training. It will connect you directly to Lisa and I. So I hope you'll jot that bit.ly down and engage in that tutorial as soon as you have time. Well, that's the end of the presentation. I appreciate that you sat through a long, recorded, not interactive presentation. Again, like I said, we'd hoped it would be different. But in these times, we do the best we can with what we've got. So you can find us not only on our Twitter accounts, but our emails. Uh, right now, we are working remotely. So uh, our email is our best contact point. We hope you'll reach out to Lisa and I, introduce yourselves. Uh, if you know for a fact that you have not contacted one of us, um, be sure you do so that you can uh, get on our distribution list for information that we will be sending out most of the summer and, of course, all of the school year. So do reach out uh, if you've um, come to this recording all on your own and have never talked to us before. Uh, we look forward to meeting you, as I said earlier, at some point in the virtual face-to-face -face world and then someday, very soon, uh, when things return to somewhat normal, we'll be able to come to your school and you can show us your great media center and talk about your ideas. And we can't wait until that happens. So thank you again, and don't forget about the Destiny training, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for watching, and welcome aboard. To learn more, ask about our course linked in eLearning. For more information on the products shared during this presentation, visit our website, librarycurrent.palmbeachschools.org, or visit our YouTube channel, PBCSD Library Media Services.